Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Helen Sullivan. I'm the director of the Melbourne School of Government, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the University of Melbourne John Button Lecture, delivered this year by David Marr. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we stand, the peoples of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. The University of Melbourne John Button Lecture is an annual lecture given by the winner of the John Button Prize for Nonfiction Writing on Public Policy and Politics that enhances our understanding of the long-term issues facing Australia. The prize honours the considerable contribution to public policy and public debate made by John Button, Senator for Victoria between 1974 and 1993. A graduate of the University of Melbourne in arts and law, John became a prominent barrister in Melbourne as well as an influential member of the Australian Labour Party. In public policy terms, John Button is perhaps best known for his work as industry minister, began under Hawke in 1983. He oversaw substantial reform of the Australian industry, challenging ideological and sectional interests and enabling many industry sectors to succeed in the global marketplace. John was also a keen writer, contributing a great deal of journalism and three books on politics after his retirement. In 1996, he became chairman of the Melbourne Writers' Festival, a fitting appointment for someone acknowledged for their lucid prose. The University of Melbourne has been a keen supporter of the John Button Foundation, expressed via the provision that the prize winner gives a public lecture, this one, on any aspect of the topic that wins the prize. In 2013-14, the John Button Prize is being hosted by the Melbourne School of Government. The school, which has just had its first birthday, is in many ways a reflection of John Button's characteristics and values. It is founded on the fields of arts, business and economics and law, and its purpose is to bring disciplinary experts from across the university into conversation and collaboration with each other and with policymakers, industry leaders, civil society actors, as well as students, to find workable solutions to the governance and policy challenges facing governments and societies around the world. I hope our approach would have met with John Button's approval, given his own focus on exploring ideas to arrive at the practical, a quality that for many made him such a dominant figure in Australia's economic success. Collaboration is central to the ethos of the school. Our foundational research program is by necessity multidisciplinary, but also in most instances involves external partners from all sectors and many different parts of the world in generating new knowledge. Our innovative graduate and post-experience teaching aims to equip those working in and with government with appropriate knowledge and skills in a way that draws on and from their experiences and expertise as well as ours. For example, our Master of Public Administration brings together the study of economics, law and politics, along with philosophy and public management, a combination I'd like to think John Burton would have approved of. A common theme that runs through some of our work with students and policymakers locally, nationally and internationally is what it takes to lead effective governance change or policy reform. Those writing about John Button's leadership, including his son James, who uh, is here this evening, emphasise his courage, common sense and commitment to reason, though this does not imply he was without imagination. The Honourable Michael Kirby described in his John Button narration in 2011 how ideas sparked off him like a Catherine wheel. Nonetheless, these prior qualities don't feature too often in many leadership texts, although perhaps they should. And leadership in politics has been something of a vexed question in many advanced democracies, as public respect for political leaders wanes. Paradoxically, perhaps, while we have less faith in our political leaders, we seem to want to know more and more about what shapes and drives them. David Marr explored this theme in the quarterly essay, essay that won the John Button Prize in 2013. In Political Animal, The Making of Tony, Ab Tony Abbott, David examined Tony Abbott's life to date to get a sense of what kind of man he is and to try and assess how the most successful opposition leader of the last 40 years would perform as Prime Minister. The judges described the essay as a powerful, nuanced and beautifully written account of the man who duly became Prime Minister. Chair of the judges, former Western Australian Premier and Jeff Gallup, commented that the essay explored one of the great themes of our time, the quality of leadership, and suggested that Mara's got us thinking about what we want from our leaders, which brings us to this evening's lecture. As most, if not all of you in this room already know, David Mara is an award-winning author, journalist and broadcaster whose contribution spans politics, censorship, the media and the arts, to name just a few. Like John Button, David graduated in arts and law, though sadly at Sydney, not at Melbourne, but left law for journalism 
Over the past 25 years, he has worked for television and radio, as well as writing for the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, The Monthly, and recently, The Guardian Australia. In addition to journalism and commentary, David has written a number of highly acclaimed books, including Patrick White, A Life, Panic, The High Price of Heaven, and with Marion Wilkinson, Dark Victory. David's theme this evening builds on his essay about Tony Abbott, the potential prime minister, to examine the actuality of his leadership, focusing here on freedom. In this lecture, he asks, what type of freedom is the Abbott government pursuing? Exploring, among other things, the recent controversies about auditing the ABC, sponsorship of the Sydney Biali, and plans to change the Racial Discrimin Act, the Discrimination Act. The format this, for this evening is that David will speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for, for Q&A. Um, but before that, please join me in welcoming David Marr to deliver this year's University of Melbourne John Button Lecture. Thank you all very much. It's customary at this time to give um, some words of praise about the man whose name sits on this speech and on the prize that I was um, very, very grateful and surprised to be awarded earlier in the year. But I want to reduce that to simply this tiny anecdote. I've spoken to a lot of people in the course of preparing tonight's address. Um, I've spoken to lawyers and to politicians and to public servants. And all I have to report is one of those public servants who said to me, oh, David, the John Button address. I used, to, I used to work for John Button, and all I thought all the time was, if only he was Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> On the 6th of August, 2012, barely two years ago, the man who would become Prime Minister declared hostilities in a new conflict. The speech he delivered that night to the Institute of Public Affairs he called the Freedom Wars. To listen to his eloquent enthusiasm, he might have been an American on the stump. When Americans get going about freedom, trumpets sound and there are choirs of angels. But this was a young, very conservative Australian singing his own song to freedom. Freedom of speech, he said, is an essential foundation of democracy. Without free speech, free debate is impossible, and without free debate, the democratic process cannot work properly, nor can misgovernment and corruption be fully exposed. Freedom of speech is part of the compact between citizen and society on which democratic government rests. That night, Abbott declared free speech not only the foundation of democracy, but essential to human integrity, allowing us to express who we are and what we believe. He showed himself alert to the old fallibility of politicians talking about freedom. It's human nature, of course, he said, to support free speech as long as it's agreeable. And he committed himself even to protecting speech, which isn't always accurate and isn't always fair. The price of free speech, he said, is that offence will be given, facts will be misrepresented, and lies will be told. Truth, after all, only emerges from such a process. Thanks to free speech, error can be exposed, corruption revealed, arrogance deflated, mistakes corrected, the right upheld, and truth flaunted in the face of power. This man went to the polls promising to do more than stop the boats, axe the tax and end the waste. He was also pledging to restore our freedom. The passion, the rhetoric and the breadth of the undertaking he made that night to the Australian people and renewed in the months that, that followed was new in the politics of this country and it was wonderful. Essentially, he said, we are the Freedom Party. We stand for the freedoms which Australians have a right to expect and which governments have a duty to uphold. We stand for freedom and, we, and will be freedom's bulwark against the encroachments of an unworthy and dishonourable government. So how's it going after a year? 
not so well. <laughs> Canberra does not seem seized by the cause of liberty. No laws have changed for the better. The ABC is once more under attack from a coalition government. Old security laws that limit speech remain in force. New laws to further restrict speech are about to be legislated. A search by the Australian Law Reform Commission for lost freedoms and privileges will now not be reporting until late next year. Even this might prove too soon for the Commission to complete its Herculean task. Unprecedented peacetime secrecy surrounds government operations. And having backed Andrew Bolt's right to be obnoxious and objectionable to pale skin Aborigines, Tony Abbott enthusiastically barracked for Chris Kenny's defamation action against the ABC for a joke. To dismiss this simply as fresh proof that politicians will say one thing to get elected and do another once they're in office would be a mistake. A lot is revealed here about this country, about the process that brought Abbott to office, about his ally, the Attorney General George Brandis, and about the Prime Minister himself, whose notion of freedom is interesting, conflicted, and laid bare in the patchy execution of the Freedom Wars he declared in opposition, in opposition two years ago. I've argued before, indeed in the essay that brings me here tonight, I've argued before that there are many abbots. Values abbot with a commitment to faith and a unique political past. And this politics abbot who gets down and dirty when required, which in bringing the coalition to office was frankly most of the time. Politics Abbott proved one of the most skilled opposition leaders in our lifetime. And this intellectual Abbott, who can talk ideas with almost Oxford polish and turns out opinion pieces for daily newspapers on everything from the future of marriage to the state of the Federation. One day in the opposition, in his opposition leader's office in Sydney, the blinds drawn at noon against the light. I asked him which of these abbots we would see once he's in office. I can't quote his answer because he decided that the whole interview would be off the record. But the gist of what he said is this, we will get whichever abbot the occasion demands. I wrote, <clears throat> values abbot in power would mean no prospect in this country for gay marriage, drug reform, euthanasia, a republic, or a bill of rights. The last on the list he regards as a complete waste of time. Win or lose, nothing will be done to roll back abortion rights because politics Abbott knows that's simply not possible. Values Abbott would work to cushion families from the realities of economic life, and if the coalition parties allowed him, valued at, values Abbott would protect working men and women from the full force of the labour market. Values Abbott is not there to help the nation's rich get richer, but he won't put his career on the line for any of this. He won't abandon his old faith-based principles, but he won't be a martyr to them either, because the Abbott that matters is politics Abbott. The budget proved that. With the budget, as I wrote in the Saturday paper, with the budget, the Prime Minister finally put his DLP past behind him and joined the Liberal Party. Values Abbott has proved a pushover in the economic field. But was Values Abbott still standing by the mission? But is Values Abbott still standing by the mission he has seen himself pursuing ever since he was swept up into the romantic Santa Maria movement and its mission to protect Western civilization? which for Abbott means Christ, the Bible, Catholic teaching on life and death, the papacy, the monarchy, Shakespeare, the English language, Churchill, Edmund Burke, scientific curiosity, belief in the equality of man, universal suffrage, and the one item he never leaves off the list, freedom under the law. It's there in Genesis, Abbott told, the IPA. Freedom and the problems of freedom. 
In the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve could do almost as they please, he reminded the IPA. But freedom turned out to have its limits and its abuses, as this foundational story makes only too clear. Yet, without freedom, we can hardly be human, hardly be worthy of creation in the image of God. From the Garden of Eden to the Exodus, Athenian democracy, the Roman Senate, Magna Carta, the glorious revolution and American independence, the story of our civilization has been the story of freedom and our struggles to achieve it. Freedom speaks English. I've never found anything Abbott has ever said or written to suggest a role for the French Revolution. 1848 goes unmentioned. The Chartists don't get a look in, let alone, well, let alone trade unionists, nor does Tom Paine and the rights of man. In Abbott's conception, liberty doesn't grow out of political brawling or class warfare or great proclamations. Though he admits the war against George III was not irrelevant. He says that in America. He keeps that, he keeps that in America. He, he, will, he will allow that a war against George III mattered. His lavish praise of American freedom stops short, of course, of the First Amendment. And maybe I haven't known where to look, but I have not found a speech or essay by Abbott in praise of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As he sees it, the ground from which freedom sprang is Christianity. I'd be one of the doubters who would tend to argue that the churches, Catholic and Protestant, fought tooth and nail to prevent the emergence of liberal democracy. But Abbott claims we have the faith to thank for the presumption of innocence, universal suffrage, limited government, and religious, cultural, and political pluralism. And Abbott sees freedom spreading through society, through the organic evolution of the common law. He doesn't turn to Dicey or Blackstone to make this point. Again and again, he cites Tennyson's tribute to England, a land of settled government a land of just renown, where freedom slowly broadens down from precedent to precedent. These lines mean a great deal to him. He calls them pithy, he quotes them all the time, particularly when he's in America. He, say, he, gives, he quotes them to think tanks, he quotes them, quotes them to students, he quotes them to young liberals. He's always at his most expansive when he's addressing the young liberals in January of each year. January seems to be a particularly big picture month for Tony Abbott. <laughs> but the poem, when you look at it, Tennyson's poem, is an attack on the Great Reform Act of 1832. Now, I'm not pinning Tennyson's political views on Abbott, but his favorite evolution, his favorite image of the evolution of liberty is taken from a diatribe against one of the key, most hard-fought achievements of British liberty. Tennyson's poem is Tory rubbish. <laughs> Tennyson goes on to condemn the idea of England becoming a country where banded unions persecute opinion and induce a time when single thought is civil crime and individual freedom mute. It's claptrap. It has a bit of an Abbott ring to it. <laughs> the notion of freedom coming gently down, posing few challenges to power. To the conservative mind of, of a man like Abbott, freedom is identified by instinct. You know it when you see it. It's not set out in documents. It's not set out in proclamations. It's not set out in laws. You feel it. Of course, he's willing to admit, as we all admit, I suppose, that we do fight for freedom from time to time. But in Abbott's case, it's only abroad, and usually with America. Emerging from the White House last year, Abbott reported discussing with President Obama how our countries have stood together in defense of peace and freedom during every major conflict in the past century. But at home, Abbott doesn't welcome struggle on behalf of freedom. He doesn't want haste, he doesn't want division, he doesn't want old institutions undermined. 
He doesn't want bills or charters or great declarations of rights. He wants freedom to broaden down from precedent to precedent, protected not by courts and constitutions, but by convention, by common law, by politicians, and most importantly, the crown. Being who he is, Abbott is much troubled by freedom's tendency to license. It's Adam and Eve again. Abbott's image of liberty, of liberty is stern and virtuous. It's not about sensuality, decadence, or frivolity. Ever since he fell in with Bob Santamaria's people on the campus of Sydney University in the 1970s, he has feared the impact of the permissive sexual revolution. And as young minister for workplace Re relations, Abbott identified a highly contagious mutant strain of liberalism that can't work out when one person's freedom stops and another's starts, and which feels constrained by the ideal of freedom from discouraging, let alone preventing, self-indulgent, counterproductive, and destructive behavior. The liberal state, he said, carries within it the seeds of its own destruction. If it is just liberal, if it cannot coerce or even criticize the misuse of freedom. All conservatives fear they're living in a fragile world. But Tony Abbott's fears have a certain edge because he credits the church with having held civilization together. And now the church has lost its binding authority in the world. Shared values and strong governments are left to do what they can to fill the gap left by the church. And this leaves Abbott with a particular affection for power and a particular fear of freedom misused. No one doubts freedom must be constrained by law. I certainly don't. It's a common position of us all. But the question always is, how tightly? Abbott's is a liberty of rules. He doesn't celebrate free spirits, except rather touchingly, the freedom to get on a bike or behind the wheel of a car. <laughs> the bike, he said, is a freedom machine. The freedom of drugs and sex repels him. The freedom offered by a Bill of Rights and the power for citizens to assert their freedoms he finds repugnant. But so do most politicians in this country. They look after themselves. Their instincts are finely tuned. As Abbott told Laurie Oakes very candidly one night, the problem with the Bill of Rights is that it takes power off the elected politicians. <laughs> Abbott's idea of liberty gives way more easily than we might wish in the face of demands for order, security, and religion. Allowing Catholic hospitals to refuse to employ gay surgeons, he regards as a fundamental freedom that trumps individual rights. Lesbian surgeons too, for that matter. The argument that church, hospitals, and schools, and nursing homes, and holiday camps on Phillip Island should play by secular rules when using public money, Abbott dismisses as an attempt to undermine religious freedom in the name of civic liberty. I'd call it a privilege extended to bigots, but that's just me. <laughs> and before we mock Abbott here, let's remember his position is backed by most governments in this country and by the Labour Party. It's a unique Australian abridgment of freedom, fully funded by the state. And it's so left-wing of me to carp about it. Nowhere in Abbott's pantheon of the great defenders of Western civilization and its freedoms is any figure who might remotely be called left-wing. The local defenders who earn Abbott's praise range from Bob Santa Maria on the one hand to the monarchist David Flint on the other. On the way to the polls in 2013, Abbott and his shadow Attorney General George Brandis put a great deal of effort into the argument that freedom is a conservative cause, while repression, particularly of free speech, was the natural instinct of the left. In August last year, Brandis called on the ghosts of Stalin and Pol Pot to make his point when he addressed the Center for Independent Studies. <coughs> Some might call his line of argument insane. 
But because I don't share the taste for personal abuse of, say, a Piers Ackerman or an Andrew Bolt, <laughs> let me call it simply surprising. <laughs> How can it be, Brandis asked, that at the end of a century in which there were more people killed in the name of ideological causes of the left than in any century in human history before, how can it be that at the end of a century that saw the embrace by the authoritarian left of murder on an industrial scale as a political and ideological method, how can it be that we on our side of politics abandoned human rights as a cause to the left? Not all, but some did it. We have to re-embrace the human rights debate. We have to remind people that we in the Liberal Party are the party of human rights. Can you believe that? <laughs> Can you believe that in today's Australia, the man who has become Attorney General was beating the left around the head with the murders of Stalin and Pol Pot? There is a rule, of course, and a good rule, that whenever one cites Hitler, you lose the argument. Let's add Stalin, shall we? to the list of people whose memory should never be called on in a modern liberal democracy to abuse one's opponents. But in any case, I don't remember a commitment to human rights being self-evident in the Liberal Party of the Howard years. As NGOs were defunded for criticising the government, whistleblowers like Alan Kessing were prosecuted, demonstrators were demonised, School curricula attacked, museums attacked, conclusive certificates deployed to defeat FOI, Hanif twice imprisoned without charge, first by the police and then by the Minister for Immigration, a new regime of press censorship imposed on the back of the London terrorist outrages of 2005, the culture wars ground on, targeting principally one of the most trusted institutions in this country, the ABC. We got through, of course, they weren't totalitarian times, but the Liberals under Howard didn't feel to me like a party of natural liberal instincts. What were the beefs Abbott and Brandis had with the left as the elections approached, the elections of 2013 approached? Two were not trivial. That Labour, and let's put to one side for the moment the question of whether conflating Labour with the left makes any sense at all. <laughs> that Labour had made half-baked proposals to discipline the press and, and to absurdly wide protections to citizens in amalgamated anti-discrimination laws against abuse and insult. One of the beefs of Abbott and, and Brandis was simply silly, that the left hadn't rallied to the cause of poor martyred Andrew Bolt. Most fundamental was and is the claim that anti-discrimination laws pursued by the left are warping society and robbing us of our traditional freedoms. In order to stay calm, I'm going to need some water. Otherwise, I might get bad tempered. Um, and, sorry, thank you. Now this idea that anti-discrimination somehow robs us of our freedoms, doesn't come from Edmund Burke or John Stuart Mill. It isn't philosophy, it's pure politics. A, co a coalition appeal to a constituency troubled what it sees as privileges given to hitherto despised minorities. Religion and race are at the heart of their campaign. Abbott and Brandis were promising to pursue once they were in office, to wind back individual protection in the name of freedom, and particularly free speech. What was being offered in those weeks to a not inconsiderable cohort of voters was the prospect of being able once again to be themselves, to express as they could in the old days, publicly and without sanction, distaste, dislike, and even hatred of old targets of abuse, among them, principally among them, gays and blacks. There was always more to repealing 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act 
than salving the wounded pride of poor Andrew. Thank you. Carefully harvested, there are votes to be won by rolling back the protections there, particularly if the reasons can be as eloquently put as they were by Abbott in a long interview he gave The Australian the Thursday before polling day. Any, suge any, suggest any suggestion, he said, any suggestion you can have free speech as long as it doesn't hurt people's feelings is ridiculous. If we're going to be a robust democracy, if we're going to be a strong civil society, if we're going to maintain that great spirit of inquiry, which is the spark that has made our civilization so strong, then we've got to allow people to say things that are unsayable in polite company. We've got to allow people to think things that are unthinkable in polite company and take their chances in open debate. I can't fault, fault a word of that. I give it a standing ovation. Of course, the plan with 18C was always to take the charges, the changes much, much further, to license hatred and intimidation. Sorry, to license humiliation and intimidation. That's where I believe most Australians, including me, fall out with Abbott. And that's a position that doesn't split left, right. I'm for getting rid of offend and insult. I'm not for getting rid of humiliate and intimidate from Section 18C. And that's a position that's widely held in the right as well as the left by lawyers across Australia, by most of the civil liberties organisations in Australia. It's a pretty common position. But Abbott was always proposing something much more radical. In conversation with Paul Kelly and Dennis Shanahan in that interview, Abbott also confirmed rather incoherent plans of the coalition to nobble the Human Rights Commission and roll back anti-discrimination protections more generally. His precise words were not reported by the Oz, but what the Oz said was, the Abbott Brandis position is certain to provoke a firestorm of opposition from the Labour Party and the Greens, given their deep attachment to cultural and institutional change through the application of anti-discrimination law. Senator Brandis has attacked the Human Rights Commission as, quotes, an anti-discrimination commission with little attachment to classical human rights. Asked by the Australian if he had the tenacity to force through those reforms, Senator Brandis said, I was born for it. When Mr. Abbott was questioned about the extent of his commitment to the agenda, he said, I think I can say I have helped to encourage George in that direction. On Victory Night, September 8th, something odd happened. I was there at the Four Seasons Hotel in Sydney, watching Abbott address a throng of excited liberals, drooling lobbyists, and exhausted journalists. But Freedom Abbott didn't show. He wasn't there. Liberty didn't get a mention. He declared Australia open for business, but he didn't pledge to the crowd on that night, as he had a year earlier to the IPA, to stand for the freedoms which Australians have a right to expect and which governments have a duty to uphold. It was not a happy omen. So how has liberty fared in the first year of the new government? Let's do it as a diary. September the 20th, a fortnight after the government came to power. September the 20th, Tim Flannery is dismissed as Chief Climate Commissioner a move applauded by commentator Nick Cater as a sign the new government will show zero tolerance, tolerance for evangelism on the public purse, on anthropogenic global warming or any other matter. October the 10th. After doing what he could from opposition to limit the effectiveness of Labour's proposed shield laws, that is laws to protect journalists from revealing their sources, Brandis in government removed them from the agenda of the next and subsequent meetings of the Attorneys General of the Commonwealth. The proposals have disappeared. October the 23rd, 
A 30-year-old Swedish film is banned at the request of the Australian Federal Police. Police intervention in, of this kind is extremely rare. Barman's Or won Sweden's leading film prizes when it appeared in 1980, was the country's official entry in the Academy Awards, and according to the Fairfax Press, has never been banned in any other country. All these, but it was in Australia, and all these months later, the review board has yet to publish its reasons. But the 11-year-old hero is shown naked, and there's a glimpse of an erection. Barnum's All can, of course, be downloaded, as I did, from the internet and viewed in full. A bill to introduce further reform of the classification system, that is, the system that regulates what we can see on television and, at times, on the internet, is with the Senate inquiry now. It's not as radical as the Australian Law Reform Commission hoped, but so far it has the government's backing. But the chaotic state of the Senate may mean the government may need the votes of moral warriors on the red benches, as they once needed the vote of Brian Harradine. I grew to be terribly fond of Brian Harradine by the end. <laughs> Censorship was at its maddest in this country when Harradine's vote was most wanted. The senators to watch today are the DLP's John Madigan and Family First's Bob Day. November the 1st. The first use of the term on water matters by Scott Morrison and Lieutenant General Angus Campbell. With this, a curtain of secrecy is drawn around Operation Sovereign Borders. The new government would not say anything now about the presence of boats, the action taken against them, or the fate of refugees. The claim this secrecy frustrates the people smugglers, smugglers has never been convincing. It certainly saves the squeamish in Australia from knowing what is being done in their name, and it frustrates lawyers trying to help refugees. Hiding what's happening in detention camps here and in the Pacific continues, as always, to be imposed in the name of privacy. You'd understand that. It's important to realise that in the refugee system, no freedoms or privileges apply. It is a freedoms, it is a freedoms, privileges and rights free zone, as much as the government can organise it, and not just this government. As far as possible, all rights are abrogated in favour of the free exercise of power by the minister. It's not a revolutionary change. The coalition government has simply refined the practices of labour. November the 18th. Edward Snowden reveals in the ABC and The Guardian that Australian spy agencies have targeted the personal phone of an Indonesian president, Bang Bang Susilo Yudhoyono, his wife, and the phones of his inner circle. Abbott would come to accuse the ABC of seeming to delight in broadcasting allegations by a traitor. But his first complaint was about the alliance between The Guardian and the national broadcaster. Why, he asked, why should the ABC be acting as an advertising agent for a left-wing British newspaper? Which sounds to me like an allegation of treason. Abbott told the Sydney broadcaster, Ray Hadley, this gentleman, Snowden, but he corrected himself, and this is a very important Abbott correction, or this individual, Snowden, <laughs> who has betrayed his country and in the process has badly, badly damaged other countries that are friends of the United States. And of course, the ABC didn't just report what he said, they took the lead in advertising what he said. That was a deep concern. Those concerns, of course, were amplified by a quite brutal attack by News Limited on the ABC and the ABC management for publishing a story which, to my mind, they would have given their eye teeth to have had for themselves. <laughs> December the 2nd, Brandis authorises an ASIO raid on the Canberra office of Bernard Collery, the lawyer representing East Timor in its dispute with Australia over the Timor Sea Treaty. The International Court of Justice at The Hague would order Australia in March this year 
to seal that material seized in the raid and keep it from all Australian officials involved in the, in the dispute. That order is binding. December the 11th, Brandis announced the Australian Law Reform Commission would have a look at every law ever passed in Canberra and indeed in Melbourne before Melbourne was, before Canberra was Melbourne, or Melbourne was Canberra, every federal law to identify where traditional rights, freedoms and privileges are unnecessarily compromised within the legal structure of the Commonwealth. For too long we have, be, we have seen freedoms of the individual diminish and become devalued. The coalition government will strive to protect and restore them. I don't want a Magna Carta. I can't, I can't follow this, but I give it to you. I don't want a Magna Carta, he told Commissioner Rosalind Croucher. I want a doomsday book. <laughs> I thought the doomsday book was a count of kind of buildings and sheep across England. But anyway. But there was always something rather peculiar about the vast operation Brandis planned. It didn't focus on individual rights at all. Free speech was a one-line entry in the vast terms of reference. But as, it, as Brandis explained at the time, the Commission will focus in particular upon commercial and corporate regulation, environmental regulation, and workplace relations. In, later, in a later interview with the Financial Review, the core of what worried him became clear. He spoke of the reversal of the onus of proof, the creation of strict liability offences, the removal of lawyer-client privilege, and the removal of rights against self-incrimination. Now that is not a free speech agenda. True, the final terms of reference for the inquiry in May this year were so enormously widened they'd allow the Law Reform Commission if it ever had the resources to do so, to examine almost everything under the sun touched by federal legislation. But by Brandis's own omission, what's closest to his heart are the powers given to bodies like ASIC and the Australian Tax Office to snare corporate crooks. December the 17th, Brandis announces the appointment of Tim Wilson, a former senior officer of the Institute for Public Affairs, the IPA, to the Australian Human Rights Commission as Freedom Commissioner with a special brief to restore balance to the Australian Human Rights Commission, which during the period of the Labor government, he said, had become increasingly narrow and selective in its view of human rights. If Brandis thought he was appointing a cipher, he's failed. Wilson represents an unfamiliar beast in Australia I'm sorry, an unfamiliar beast in Australian liberal, that's with a capital L, politics. He's actually a libertarian in the old sense of the word. Yes, the freedom of business is high on his priorities and he was passionate about the freedom of tobacco, for instance. But so is the freedom of the individual. Let me tell you, being gay helps focus the mind on those issues. Already, he's mapping territory that goes beyond the narrow Brandis view of the terrain of freedom. He's spoken about promoting freedom of speech, not just wiping 18C, but winding back defamation laws. He's spoken about freedom of association, freedom of movement, and freedom of property. Of course, most of those are matters of state law, which means the Australian Law Reform Commission has little purchase in those areas. Graham Innes, in his splendid address to the Queensland Press Club the other day, when he was retiring, remarked, God, he's a wonderful man, remarked, the best way, frankly, for the Attorney General to provide the Commission with the greater capacity to deal with the freedoms he talks about would be to put forward legislation for a charter of rights. <laughs> that isn't on the agenda. Though there are interesting rumbles out there on the far right where, behind the race talk, are worries that the nation is slipping away from under them, that it won't be the same country for their children, that the Judeo-Christian ethic of the place is at risk, and perhaps, perhaps, the only way to save the nation is to have a Bill of Rights. 
January the 22nd, the ABC reported allegations from asylum seekers forced back to Indonesia that Australian military personnel had deliberately burnt their hands. Once again, the uproar against the ABC was led by News Limited and joined by the Prime Minister who declared from Davos, where he was at the time, that there was, quotes, absolutely no evidence to back those claims. A few days later, back in Sydney, Abbott said, I think it dismays Australians when the national broadcaster appears to take everyone's side but our own. You shouldn't leap to be critical of your country. Treachery again. A patriotic blast that followed, furious denials, led to the ABC faltering. Its managing director, Mark Scott, apologised for imprecise wording. Not withdrawing, but apologising for imprecise wording. No Australian authorities tracked the asylum seekers down in Indonesia, nor did anyone, it seems, from the ABC or from News Limited, which continued to thunder about the falsity of the story, the disgrace of the ABC in publishing them, etc., etc., etc. But Fairfax did. And the result was a great piece by Michael Bachelard, giving a detailed and persuasive account of Australian military personnel brutalising refugees. March the 7th, Abbott came to the defence of Chris Kenny. Now, Chris Kenny didn't like the joke that was made about him on a chaser program celebrating the election night. I was on the program myself, of course. Philip Adams and I were in the back of a truck trying to escape the country in order to survive <laughs> as latte-loving latte lefties in a freer society than would be available under Abbott. Everybody was up for ridicule that night. It was a night of complete ridicule. And to ridicule Chris Kenny's obsessions with the ABC, they showed themselves to be as silly as Chris Kenny could possibly ever imagine. And they put up a joke of Chris Kenny humping a dog. You've all seen it now. It's one of the most famous jokes in Australia. It's even more famous than the fabulous joke of Patrick Cook's about Harry Seidler's, Harry Seidler's architecture, which Harry Seidler sued over. Anyway, Kenny sued. He's told me, he wouldn't deny to me that News Limited was providing the funds for the suit. There was, again, a furious campaign against, against the ABC by News Limited and by the government. And on March the 7th, Abbott, who, by the way, has a law degree, came up with this. The point I make, he said, is that government money should, should be spent sensibly and defending the indefensible. How good were you at defo law, Tony? Defending the indefensible is not a very good way to spend government money. And here comes the threat. Next time the ABC comes to the government looking for more money, this is the kind of thing that we would want to ask questions about. Mark Scott immediately caved in. Kenny got his money and his apologies. The ABC was humiliated. News Limited had a triumph. March 13, Brandis announced plans to punish arts companies if, for what he called political reasons, they turn their backs on private sponsorship. He instructed the Australia Council to draft a protocol that would strip public funding from theatre companies and galleries and so on, who might be tempted to follow the lead of the Sydney Biennale, which had refused funding from Transfield because a division of the company runs immigration detention centres. Note again, we're back in the refugee world. When you get close to the refugee world, rights and privileges and traditional protections are wiped away. That's, it's necessary, you see, because we're fighting a war with these people. They're invading our country and its wartime conditions and all usual civil freedoms have to be wiped off. Not, of course, just for refugees. This is the important point of all of this. That instinct spreads wider into the community. Brandis is now talking about arts companies, not refugees, not, not people who have the temerity to turn up on our beaches looking for protection from, from, um, from their difficulties back home, arts companies now. Months later, I checked with them this week, months later, the Australia Council is still struggling 
to come up with a formula for determining the sort of sponsorship that can reasonably be declined without sacrificing government funding at the same time. If reasonableness is to be decided by the Minister for the Arts, it will be the most direct political intervention in the allocation of funding in the history of the Australia Council. March the 25th, Brandis finally publishes the exposure draft of changes to the Racial Discrimination Act. The bill that went into Cabinet was drafted by the Attorney General's department. We have not seen it. It had a completely different name and was, we understand, quite a fundamental redrafting of the Act. There was a press release ready to be released. We haven't seen that either. That's been refused under FOI. What we do know is that the Cabinet rejected that piece of legislation and Brandis was ordered to do something else, which was to make some changes to the original Act, to keep the Act and make the changes. He did the redrafting. I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, go all the way back into, you know, poor martyred Andrew and, and, you know, the Racial Discrimination Act as a whole. There is a whole night could be spent on the use that has been made of the case that was brought against Andrew Bolt, the political use that's been made of that. I do want to say two things about it, though. One is a wonderful statement by my old colleague, by my old colleague Paul Kelly. We work together on the National Times. I disagree with a lot of things Paul Kelly says, but I admire him. I think he's a true, he's a true professional. He said of Andrew Bolt's pieces, you know, abusing light-skinned Aborigines for, for only late in life, adopting Aboriginality for professional or political purposes, all of which turned out to, of course, to be untrue, because they'd all been brought up as from childhood to regard themselves and be regarded as Aboriginal. Paul Kelly said, those articles should never have been published, full stop. Now, he doesn't like the Racial Discrimination Act as it stands. I don't like it either as it stands. Um, but I, I, I go back and back to that resolute statement of Kelly's, those articles should never have been published. What troubles me is that the Attorney General of this country, a QC, goes around saying that Andrew Bolt was prosecuted merely for publishing an opinion. They're his words, they're the words of the Attorney General, merely for publishing an opinion. Now that's the kind of thing an ignoramus could say, simply reading the newspapers. This is a QC. That is a complete misrepresentation of Bromberg's judgment in the federal court. It is a complete misrepresentation of it. There's a convention in this country, and why is it that always lefties go on and on about conventions? when, you know, vigorous politicians know that conventions are there to be shattered, ignored, broken, recast. But there's a convention in this country that the Attorney General stands a little bit apart from politics, just a little bit indeed above politics. And a statement like that, merely for publishing an opinion, is a willful, deliberate misrepresentation of the judgment of the federal court. And I don't get it. I don't get why it's necessary. You can have sincere and well-argued objections to the whole process that took Bolt to that court, and you can argue about the outcome, but that's a misrepresentation of what happened. March 25th, as I say, Brand has published an exposure draft of the changes to the RDA. All on ice now, I understand, done for, not gonna happen. And the pity of that, because of the uproar and, and of the uproar over the breadth of those changes, open slather for the for the public expression of hatred of, of, of people on the basis of race. I regret that because I think that act urgently needs amendment. It appears now that essentially nothing will happen, certainly nothing in the short term. May twenty third, Morrison strips the Refugee Council of Australia of half a million dollars allocated in the budget only days before 
Morrison explained he'd only just found out about it. It's not, he said, it's not my view or the government's view that taxpayer funding should be there for what is effectively an advocacy, advocacy group. Morrison admitted that this was a deliberate return to the Howard era rules. Philip Ruddick had taken the money off the council and it had been restored by Rudd. The CEO, the present CEO of the council, Paul Power, called it petty and vindictive. He told the ABC, this in many ways illustrates the state of the relationship between the non-government sector, particularly organisations working on asylum issues, and the government at the moment. And in the aftermath, ACOS was extremely worried about whether or not this, this defunding of bodies critical of the government would extend to a number of other bodies. And as we know, funding has been removed from a whole list of bodies which hitherto provided government with independent, independent and at times critical advice. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an absolute return to the Howard era. Howard used to call himself an old Voltairian and he used to talk about dying for the right to let you say things that he deeply disagreed with. And may, he may well have been willing to die but the thing about the coalition is they're never willing to pay, <laughs> which is, of course, the fundamental problem with the ABC. Um, July the 3rd, Abbott announces the decision to review the country's counter-terrorism laws in the light of what's happening in Syria, and he confirmed plans to scrap the National Security Legislation Monitor. The laws proposed, which will, will go through Parliament, and they'll go through Parliament with the support of the Labour Party, have many aspects. One of them which particularly touches me is that journalists will now be jailed for even longer periods than before under the How that, that was established under the Howard legislation, even longer periods for revealing security operations. And then there's the whole business of the storage of metadata that has not been abandoned by the government that has simply been postponed for further consideration. Brandis is on record, and there are others on record, saying the government is very keen to pursue the, the collection of metadata on all of us, which will mark an Orwellian extension of the state supervision of our lives. It will be everything, ladies and gentlemen. It will be right down to your searches for porn. It will all be recorded, it, everything. Every search you do on the internet, every call you make, when you make it, who you make it to, how long you spoke for, all of that is proposed to be, to be collected. That has not been abandoned by the government. There have been some congratulations extended to the government for the civil liberties um, notion that they've put it to one side my understanding is that it has not been put to one side. Well, that's where we stand. That's the diary. That's the diary of the first year. And I don't think it's particularly promising. How does this record... Well, of it all, it seems to me that there are two things which, in the John Button sense, present practical problems. The first is the anti-terrorism laws if it comes through a metadata collection. The second is the attack on the ABC. You, are all, you will all remember what that attack was like under Howard. And you will all know that the ABC emerged from that attack as highly regarded in the community as before. Howard has conceded to some ABC executives that the Liberal Party was damaged by those attacks on the ABC. They lost the affection of doctors' wives. That category, is, that category is bigger than the actual spouses of actual medicos. But Howard recognised that they did themselves damage by those attacks. And the ABC is actually not a fragile institution. The Senate, as it stands at the moment, will not legislate for changes to the ABC. There, they, there is, however, always the possibility of cutting its budget. Of course, they've already lost the Australian, the Australian network, their overseas arm, 
and 80 ABC journalists in this city have lost their jobs. The capacity to, the capacity to give the ABC grief is large. The capacity to actually shut it down and change its culture is quite small. Though I must say the appointment of Janet Albrechtson and, and, um, and Old Brown um, <coughs> to be the people who, uh, to be on the committee that nominates directors is a pretty remarkably blunt politicisation of the nature of the ABC. You cannot underestimate the dream inside the ABC of being able to use its prestige and get it to sing a different song, to get it to sing a directly political song. Of course, the prestige wouldn't last more than, you know, 18 months or something. It would, be, it would be completely burnt up and wasted away. But what a glorious 18 months there could be there if you could just get it to change its song. The left is supposed to be responsible. I have a new plan. Whenever anybody uses the left, whenever anybody talks about, you know, the all-embracing nature of the left, People like me who have been part of the industrial slaughter of, um, of Russian peasants and <laughs> me who cheered on the armies that destroyed the Cambodian middle class. People like me. Um, what we've got to do all the time is to say, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by the left? Who are you talking about? Can you name those people? Are you talking about a political machine? Or are you just talking about a tendency? Has everybody signed up to the same thing? Or, or can you have different views out there on the left? Is everybody on the left responsible for everything that everybody else on the left does? I mean, how responsible am I for Pol Pot? I kind of don't feel I'm as responsible as George Brandis thinks I'm responsible for Pol Pot. <laughs> Give us the facts. Prove it. When you talk about bias at the ABC, prove it. Tell me what it is, you know, prove it. It's not a given, prove the damn thing. But that, I think, is the attacks on the ABC are the most profound cultural attacks that is going on at the moment. How, then, do we square the Tony Abbott that sang those anthems to freedom to the IPA two years ago and his record in government? What was going on that night at the IPA? It was a question of power. It was as simple as that. It was a question of power. At that point, in August 2012, his great backer, News Limited, was facing down the ham-fisted plans of Conroy to discipline the media. <laughs> Ridiculous stuff. And the martyrdom of Andrew Bolt was providing a splendid weapon to attack the, the left, those people who wouldn't go out on the barricades to fight for his slovenly journalism. And the Australian was pursuing Gillard's time at the AWU, which on the evidence so far produced, and I include in that the evidence that has been produced to Dyson Hayden's Royal Commission, on the evidence so far produced strikes me as one of the most vicious beat-ups of the era. And it was very good for Abbott. It was very good for Abbott. And what he said that night to the IPA was pitch perfect for News Limited at that time. But though he's not the greatest enemy of the ABC inside the coalition, in fact, in some ways he's quite fond of the ABC, but you won't hear him say in the ABC's defence what he said to the IPA that night, that the price of freedom is that offence will be given and that facts will be misrepresented and lies will be told. You won't hear that. There's actually no freedom, Abbott. It's just politics, Abbott. And again, in one of his many interesting disguises. His government actually has no freedom agenda. If they did, they'd be looking at defamation. Defamation which worries artists and writers more than anything to do with the freedom of speech in this country. They'd be looking at old sedition laws and they wouldn't be prevent and they wouldn't be about to legislate new security laws. They'd be looking at consorting laws. There's no agenda. We live in a country that's free. 
but it's a, a free country with little commitment to freedom. We show that we can push back. 18C, for instance, put on ice because of public disquiet. The intelligence monitor will be kept because of public disquiet. There have been reforms to the sedition laws, again, because of public disquiet. The matter laws that are legislated are never actually used because of public disquiet. But we aren't going to die in a ditch to prevent the erosion of the liberties we have. And nor, frankly, will we fight as hard as we must to win more liberty. Australia is a country peculiarly content with what it's allowed to have. None of the scandals of the last decades has shaken our faith in authority. And our native pessimism that liberty rarely wins around in Australia. We're content to be free enough and, resi and resigned to being done over, as we have been, by the coalition and by Labor, and by the coalition before that, and by the Labor before that, as long as the, as the history of liberty has been written in this country. There's no freedom, Abbott. There's politics, Abbott. It's business as usual. So we do have a small amount of time for questions uh, while David gets his How breath. How long did I go for? A good one. A good one. I'm sorry I didn't have time to write a, so a shorter speech, as they say. <laughs> but I'm sure there are questions and comments, so who would like to start? Um, the microphone's just behind you, Hans. Uh, In uh, 1983, Bertram Gross uh, wrote a book uh, titled The Friendly Fascism, where he was looking at uh, political developments in the U.S., and this was, of course, the early Reagan years. And he said, he, he defined fascism in a very broad sense as a conflation of big business and big government with very authoritarian controls. And he said that fascism had not yet appeared in the US, but there was the potential. So under Abbott, do we see perhaps a, a possibility of a so-called friendly fascism? Like none, none whatever. None whatever. I mean, no, none whatever. This is a lawful country. An absolutely, an absolutely essential element of fascism is that you stop free elections. That's not, I mean, it's, his, his instincts aren't fascist. The possibilities in this country aren't fascist. That to me, I'm afraid to say, if I may, is as ridiculous as, as Brandis talking about Stalin and Pol Pot, or the ghosts of Stalin and Pol Pot. It's just not a remote possibility. We are not that kind of society. It will not happen here, and nor is the coalition or, or Abbott remotely the kind of party or the leader that would want it. Yes, gentlemen down the front. Can you wait till the microphone gets to you? There are microphones racing towards you from all <laughs> corners of the room. Thanks. That's probably a bit better. Um, look, I was wondering, I was just discussing this only this afternoon with a, a friend who's interested in politics. The, the Liberal, I see it, uh, maybe I'm a little bit of a cynic, but I see the Liberal Party and the way it's conducting itself under Abbott <coughs> as being better than what it would have been under someone like Malcolm Turnbull. In that, we know where we are with Abbott. Abbott shows his true face. We see the real face of the Liberal Party with Abbott and Brandis and Scott Morrison. Whereas with uh, someone like Malcolm Turnbull, the whole thing could be played down, it could be ameliorated, and the rough edges shaved off and allow this party to survive a little longer. In, in a similar way, I guess, 
to the way Howard was enabled, <coughs> or we, he was survived longer because the Democrats for so many years were able to smooth off the rough edges. But when he had control of both houses in 04, he la the party lasted one term and we actually saw the, the humiliation of the Prime Minister losing his seat. Now I think uh, with Tony Abbott running the show, <coughs> We can see the opinion polls now. Yes, but we, we should move towards a question. Yeah, the yes. How, how do you feel? Is that a reasonable uh, approach to take? No. Why? Um, <laughs> I mean, what is the reality of a party? Parties, the nature of our politics. Look, in Italy you have 44 parties and they all represent you know, tiny factions and things, etc. That's not how we run politics in this country. We have big block parties. They have factions and within them. The Liberals do, Labor does as well. And the nature of a party is formed by the ways in which the groups within them um, um, battle for supremacy, for influence. The true nature of the Liberal Party, I'll tell you what the true nature of the Liberal Party. The true nature of the Liberal Party is respectable, educated Australians who have a lifelong support for that party. That's part of the truth of the Liberal Party. The truth and, and the truth of the Liberal Party is as different as the nature of a government in the nature of a government in Victoria and the nature of a government in Canberra. Here's one little example. Victoria look the Victorian Liberal Party looked at under considerable pressure, particularly from the churches, looked at the possibility of getting rid of the Human Rights Act. Keep an eye on the Phillip Island legislation. I didn't mention Phillip Island by chance in my speech. Um, and, and the Liberal Party looked at it and said, no, that's actually valuable legislation which helps the human rights, helps protect the human rights of Victorians. That's the Liberal Party in Victoria. The Liberal Party in Canberra won't have a bar of legislation of that kind. Parties are various beasts. And I, for one, have lived long enough to, not to believe that one party represents all good and one party represents all even, evil. I just don't. I just don't. I'm no, I am not singing love songs to the Labour Party, let me tell you. If you've read my work, you know where I stand on that. But, but the notion that, you know, that there's this inevitably evil Liberal Party and, you know, the problem with Malcolm Turnbull is that he would put an acceptable face on this vile machine. I just don't accept it at all. Not at all. Okay. Question over there. Uh, David, um, given the discrepancies between the various uh, versions of Abbott, which to the rest of us sound like blatant lying... <gasps> oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> Yes. And without drawing you into a diagnosis on the grounds of insanity, do you, do you think he actually hears the lie? Or is, is, he is that he actually, actually is a liar? He just hears the lie as he's saying it. He, I, can't, I watch it and I, I can't, it, it, I'm gobsmacked. He says one I, thing one minute and then the other and he doesn't seem to see the distinction. Well, look, that's not uncommon in politicians. <laughs> um, but the thing that really fascinates me about Abbott and which powered the essay I wrote yeah. is this sense that he has of himself, of the he sense he has of himself of coming from this very interesting past with these very big commitments to, to being good and, and a very strong sense that when power comes to him, he will grow as a great leader. Now, frankly, I don't think he's been doing too badly in the last few days at all. Um, but he is a very interesting figure because what he represents as his values, what he represents as what really matters to him, does not often get expressed in what he does. Um, and, and I've spent years exploring that, and I've explored a little bit more of it tonight. But it isn't lying. It isn't lying. We're all many selves inside ourselves, and he is very particular selves inside himself. And he's very aware of it as well. He knows that he's very different people in there. And when I asked him that question about which abbot we will get, he took it very seriously indeed, because he knows that there are lots of abbots. 
And his task is to make sure that there's some coherence there which will satisfy the public sense of him um, and that the right one comes out. And my analysis of the problem with the budget was that he presented an abbot at the budget that no one had ever really seen. This was a fresh abbot. <laughs> and it was like ground zero. Oh, sorry, no, ground zero is okay. Year zero is a problem. Um, <laughs> And, and it's not good for Abbott when you get this sense of him always having, of you always having to start again with him. Um, but no, it's not a lie. It's a really, really fascinating character. Okay, we have one here, Siobhan. Hello, my name is Siobhan Sullivan. I'm from the University of Melbourne. This is also on the psychology of Abbott, and so I'm interested in, in what your view is having spent time with him. Do you think he's sensitive to criticism and to feedback and to the community mood? Do you think beyond what's required of him uh, in terms of responding to, to the people around him in terms of, you know, uh, kind of a spin doctor sense, is he, does he feel hurt when people don't respond when, well to him? Look, I don't really know the answer to that question. I mean, obviously, you've got to be pretty tough to be even remotely anywhere near where he's been, where, he has, where he's gone. What I'm interested in is many many witnesses who say that he's not particularly tough in face-to-face -face confrontation. That, he's, that he can be incredibly tough in the public theatre of politics, but in his office or with his bureaucrats, that, he's, that he doesn't seek confrontation. That, 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 and it's a different abbot <laughs> appears. Um, he's quite collegial in that sense. And sometimes that's a problem. Um, people see that he's too collegial. But of course he's sensitive to some, to some extent. And all politicians at some level want to be well thought of. Otherwise they wouldn't be in the game. That's why they're there. That's why they want people to go to a ballot box and tell them how much they love them. <laughs> Gentlemen, there. Um, I know you talked a little bit about, obviously, the plans that have been delayed or postponed, but how do you see the next 12 months panning out, following on from tonight's presentation? Um, I have no idea. I mean, look at what's happened in the last week. This last week may be a transformative time for Abbott. We may see, we may see a figure emerge from this who can, for the first time, speak for this country. One of the things that we have to credit Howard with. I mean, my view is that John Howard is the most professional politician any of us will ever see in our lifetime. And boring as he could be, and uncongenial at times he could be, he had a way of speaking for the whole country. Abbott hasn't had that before. This week he may have found it. If he does, then his political fate is changed. And I don't mean by sort of, you know, jutting his jaw and, and warning the Tsar, though that's been pretty wonderful. Um, I must say it's given, me, it's, given me, it's given me as an Australian some real pleasure. Um, but if he can begin to seem to speak for the country, which is something he's never done as such a divisive figure before, then the next year is un quite, quite unpredictable. OK, we've got time just for a couple more, so if you can keep your questions short. Uh, David, uh, Stephen Main, great speech, uh, really interesting. Um, like us, like you and I, uh, Tony's obviously a former journalist. Yes. And journalists are trained to be pro-freedom and love disclosure. How much of his journalistic history and training do you see in the Tony Abbott now as Prime Minister? I think there's a real... I think there is a real bit of tension in him when he loses his temper with the ABC. I've read, for, for, for tonight's speech, I've read an, an enormous amount of his commentary on the ABC. And you know, when Snowden's stuff about eavesdropping on, on the Indonesian president was first published, he was, I mean, he loathes, he, he was really, really furious about that alliance between the ABC and The Guardian. But he recognised it was a story, that it had to be published, and that it would be published. 
That was the journalist in him and the realist in him as well. And of course, he wouldn't be where he was, but for Q&A, as you know. I mean, in opposition, he was the most frequent guest on Q&A. He remade himself on Q&A. He showed himself to be a bigger person than people thought he was on Q&A. So, as a journalist, he's, as a journalist, you know, he, he knows about the press and he knows, and he's got some affection for it. And he still, and he loved, even when he was a minister, a busy minister, locking his door and writing an opinion piece for the Oz or for, the, for, or for Fairfax. He loved doing that. He drove his staff demented, you know. You couldn't get to Tony on Wednesday and Thursday because he was doing another think piece um, for a newspaper. He loved all of that as well. Um, but it's also, there's something there about the way he thinks. And he thinks in op-ed pieces. And some politicians, and the imagination and the professionalism of some politicians, and, and Howard would be one, but there are, they're in all parties, are totally engaged by, the, by the, the question of how do we get there? And that's not Abbott. Abbott's not absolutely, absolutely intrigued by the mechanism of political achievement. He loves writing op-ed pieces about where you'd like to be. But the business of getting there, it's, I mean, it's a skill he may well learn, but, but it's not what first engages him. He, is really, he really loves publishing an idea and thinks that it will really have a big impact. So, you know, only a couple of years ago he was saying, let's get rid of all the states and let's give Canberra all power and let's let Canberra just give to the states a few powers here and there that they might find useful. A couple of years down the track, he's arguing, each sphere of government will now be sovereign in its own sphere. And you, you know, um, another op-ed piece coming along. Um, but that's the way he thinks, I think. But, I mean, journalists, we've, Australia's had a lot of journalist prime ministers, of course. We've had lots of them. Deakin, who used to... Deacon, who wrote articles attacking his own government under an assumed name in London newspapers. I mean, God, what a gorgeous man he was. Curtin, of course, was another, another journalist prime minister. We've had lots of journalist prime ministers. They're interesting folk. Okay, this has to be the final question at the back. Um, David, this is a bit of a follow-on, I think. Um, in terms of the the tendency to lament the quality of the political discourse in this country and the, the sloganeering, as you just touched on there, and the lack of nuanced policy discussion. How do you see that fitting into Abbott's multiple selves and multiple roles and navigating the incoherence between his values and potentially projecting and driving some of this vision and this discussion? Oh, well, you see what works, you know. <laughs> you just, you know, you see what works. You give it a run and, and you accommodate you accommodate the divisive forces inside your own cabinet and, um, you know, you, you charge forward and, um, you know, see how you go. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, politics in many ways is not a very well thought out process, you know. <laughs> you just, you know, slog on and keep going and, you know, it's a, yeah, he's got some problems but, you know, you know, some wins here and there. But, but you know, my message, my message tonight is don't be deceived. Don't be swept away by his gorgeous rhetoric about liberty and freedom because he's, in that respect, just an ordinary conservative Australian politician. And I'm not conflating conservative with Liberal Party because there are people like him with those instincts all through the Labor Party too. And the reason why this country isn't as free as it might be is because of the shared belief of the politicians in Canberra, of our federal politicians, that they don't want us to be so free. They don't even want us to elect our president. And they certainly don't want us to have a mechanism that every other liberal, every other liberal democracy on earth has. A simple mechanism which allows individual citizens to go to a court and, and enforce their liberty. That is not on because the politicians will not give it to us. And we aren't particularly perturbed as a country. 
because we are deeply trusting of authority. Much as we might belittle individual journal, uh, individual, <laughs> individual <laughs> politicians, um, on the whole, we trust. We trust them. We're really a gorgeous country. <laughs> we're orderly and we're quiet and we trust and we get on with a really quite wonderful life. The problem is that it could be more exciting <laughs> and it could be freer. But we're not going to fight for that. We'll come here tonight, and I'm very glad you've come here tonight and to listen to me moan about the deficiencies of the last year and the lost hopes. But, you know, there's no one's going to be out in the streets demanding a Bill of Rights. We're just a very curious, subtle people. Um, we'll just get on with it. We'll be free enough, but we won't be free. It doesn't trouble us particularly, though it is intriguing. So thank you very much for coming and listening to this. Ladies and gentlemen, before you go, um, it just remains for me to do two things. One, to um, let you know about the next event uh, sponsored by the John Button Foundation, which is the 2014 John Button Oration that will be given by the Honourable Fred Cheney, uh, who will be talking on the theme of what future for reconciliation, and that's part of the Melbourne's Wright Melbourne Writers' Festival on the 23rd of August. Um, so if you're interested in that, do go along. Um, I'm sure you can sign up on the website. Uh, but the final thing to say is... Um, I was thinking, how do you end a session like this? Um, and I'm going to revert back and remind you of what the judges said about David's essay. Uh, it was a powerful, nuanced, and beautifully written account. And I think what we've had this evening is a powerful, nuanced, and beautifully argued account um, of the many faces of Tony Abbott. So, David, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.